So this video is going to cover cross-sectional studies. So cross-sectional studies are the simplest of the analytical observational studies. So I'm just going to break down what that uh, means basically. So an analytical study is one that's trying to figure out whether an exposure or a treatment is uh, causing disease or uh, I guess in the case of a treatment if it's preventing or um, making people better. So it's, it's basically trying to figure out if one thing is related to another as opposed to um, a descriptive objective where a study is just trying to like measure the amount of disease in the population. And it's also observational in the sense that the treatment or exposure isn't assigned. Uh, we're basically just trying to count the number of people who uh, choose to ex expose themselves or are exposed to something and trying to see if um, them being exposed is related to having the disease or in the case of treatment in relation uh, being related to I guess preventing the disease or treating it. Um, a cross-sectional study can also have descriptive objectives um, because uh, as I'm going to get into that you're calculating prevalence usually of, a, of both an exposure and an outcome so an exposure and a disease and that can let you um, basically like publish that on its own is, is of interest to a lot of people of just what's the prevalence of this disease in a, in a given population. Um, but I'm mostly going to focus on the analytical ob objectives of a cross-sectional study. Um, so just the basics of how a cross-sectional study is carried out is um, a, like a, a sample of a population is taken at a single time. So if it's like a, popu a city with a population of like 100,000, you might sample 1,000 kind of randomly. Um, there's lots of other ways to sample. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do another video on sampling, but let's just say we take a, a simple random sample of a thousand people from the town, um, and then on this one day, for every person, we measure their disease status, their exposure status, and their confounder status on that day, basically, and we don't measure it again. Um, and then we, we can basically see if those who are exposed are more likely to also be diseased. And if we're interested in confounders, we can control for that when we're trying to figure out if these are related. Uh, a potential problem that I just wanted to illustrate here is that like the amount of exposure and disease in a population is in flux over time. So this is a population being followed for like four years, and the blue line here is the um, like percent of the population that is exposed, and this is the percent of the population that's diseased, this red line, where uh, a cross-sectional study takes a snapshot, or a cross-section, at one point in time to understand exposure and disease at that point in time, so at year one. Um, you can see that if we were to have chosen year two, the amount of disease and exposure differs. Um, one thing to note is if this was an ecological study, all we'd be measuring is the prevalence of exposure and the prevalence of disease in the population. But um, with a cross-sectional study, we have the joint distribution on the people. So basically, we, for each individual, we know both their exposure and disease status. But nonetheless, um, this amount of exposure and amount of disease can change over time. You can see with these different measurements, like here, exposure and disease have very different prevalences in the population and, and same here and uh, basically that can influence the conclusions you come to so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's some drawbacks to taking a snapshot although it's very efficient um, taking a snapshot in time has the has the issue that uh, it's not capturing these trends over time um, so this is my example so let's just say we have this village of 200 people on May 10th, 2022, and we randomly sample 80 people from this population of 200 in this village. And there's a polio outbreak in this village, and we're trying to fit, polio is like a, a waterborne disease in some developing countries. Um, we're trying to figure out it, uh, whether this polio outbreak is due to the well water or the lake water. So this is how the table would basically be set up. This is our population visually, and this is how we're representing it in the table. Um, we have the, the number that are that drink well water, the number that drink lake water, the number polio positive, and the number polio negative. And this 80 is the total population of our sample. And uh, we can figure out each combination of, of uh, well water and polio positive, well water and polio negative, etc. So these people that I have outlined in blue uh, are those who drank well water. So that's the first thing we've figured out. We figured out that uh, 
20 people drank well water and there they are and 60 people of our 80 drink lake water like where they that's where they regularly get their water um, and now we have uh, the yellow people are those who are polio positive so we have 15 people that are polio positive and 65 that are polio negative so now we have four combinations basically we have the people who are just solid black who are those who drank lake water and are polio negative um, the uh, people that are colored black and have uh, blue on the outside are those that are well water uh, exposed so well water is what they drink and they're polio negative um, so yeah and uh, yeah solid yellow is lake water and polio positive and solid yellow with a blue outlining is uh, well water exposed and polio positive um, so as soon as you see yellow there is a polio positive thing going on um, and as soon as you see a blue line, there's a well water exposed thing going on. So that's basically how I how I built from from this to this. Um, so yeah, we can we can get the the number of each of these combinations basically. And what that lets you uh, what's that what that lets you do is um, lets you figure out whether those who are exposed to well water might be more or less likely to get polio. So prevalence is something I'm going to talk about first. Uh, prevalence is the amount of disease in the population right now. And uh, those it, that basically consists of those who got the disease sometime before we came to the town or the, or the population, and they still have it. So reasons someone might uh, have got it in the past and not still have it is that they might be dead or they might have recovered before we arrived. Um, and we're not worried about people who are getting it while we're here because uh, we're not following over time, we're taking a snapshot, so it's who has the disease right now. Um, so it's basically the, the prevalence of polio <coughs> would be the number diseased over the population size. So we can take our data here. Um, if you remember, we had 15 people that were polio positive and a population of 80. Um, so we can get the prevalence of polio, it's about 19%. We can also find the prevalence of well water. Um, well water consumption, I, I should say, and that's 20 people who consumed well water over 80, so about a quarter of our village drinks well water. Um, so at first glance, when you arrive, uh, the, the people might think, uh, they might have rounded up everyone as polio and asked, you, did you drink well water and lake water? And that's a really good strategy. And let's say they found that eight people of, that have polio drank lake water and seven drank well water. That might be pretty good evidence, even though it's close, that they might be leaning on the side of lake water because more of the people with polio have lake water uh, that they that they drank. Um, but that's a bit of a naive interpretation because you also need to account for the amount of people who are exposed to lake water and the amount of people who are exposed to well water. So how we do that um, is basically we find the prevalence in the two groups. So we find the prevalence of polio in those who drank well water and the prevalence of polio in those who drank lake water. Um, so what we can do, we can start with well water. Um, so seven of the well water exposed, basically just f f for the time being, forget about the rest of the table, just focus on this well water row. We have seven people who got polio out of uh, 20 people who drank well water, so a prevalence of 35% in the well water drinking population. Um, well, in the lake water drinking population, we have eight people who got polio, but 60 people are drinking lake water. So even though on an absolute scale, more people um, who have polio drank lake water, we can now see that that's just a function of the fact that more people have lake water, period. Um, and we can see that the prevalence of polio in those who drink well water is actually much higher. Um, and although we can just see that it's that the prevalence is higher in the well water exposed um, it would be nice if we could combine these values into some measure of effect so how we do that is a prevalence ratio so um, it doesn't really matter which one you pick as the um, numerator and denominator but generally whatever you're considering exposure positive usually goes on top so if we're thinking well water is exposure positive uh, we're putting the prevalence of uh, polio in the well water drinking population on top and the prevalence of polio in those who drink lake water on the bottom. So 0.35 on top and 0.13 on the bottom. You'd get the same answer if you put 35 and 13. Yeah, I shouldn't have had to use a calculator for that, but I didn't want to give you the wrong information. Um, 
So yeah, basically when you divide that, uh, you get 2.7. So now you can say that if you drink well water, basically the, the likelihood of, um, uh, of, of being polio positive is 2.7 times higher ba based on the information we have. And that's some pretty compelling evidence that we should probably stop drinking well water until we figure this out. And uh, that's a neat explanation of like if you're a field epidemiologist in some really like rural village like this, that's a way that like you can really quickly enact change. And basically we don't even need to isolate polio from the water. We can just use this information to come to a quick answer like I could have probably done this in like a day or a couple hours and then all of a sudden we're quarantining the well water and everyone is uh well at least the the village is on its way to this polio epidemic being a thing of the past for them um so there's some limitations to cross-sectional studies for sure uh you can't establish temporality uh very well and I'm going to get into that and it's only capable of determining prevalence where incidence is uh the amount of newly occurring disease over time, and like I said, prevalence is the amount of disease right now. Uh, so, you, so these two things are, are pretty related, and I'm going to approach that pretty slowly, but also uh, I have whole videos on the relationship between prevalence and incidence and the idea of person years, so um, I'm only, I'm, I'm going to just touch on it actually. Uh, so let's just say, this is the, this is the gist of like a like where before we had a, a snapshot, this this is just going to illustrate the following forward idea. Basically, like with a cohort study or some some other non cross sectional study. Basically, the format is like let's just say we're following everyone for three years. Um, this blunted line means observation ended, and this dot means that an event occurred. So I guess di polio or disease occurred. Um, basically, we have this baseline population where no one has the disease but we know if they're exposed or not exposed and we follow them forward so after year one someone got the disease after year two another person got the disease and after year three this person like we're, we stopped observing and they never got it so they're just disease negative by the end and that person got it so now we can calculate incidence that's the amount of disease occurring over time and it also allows you to establish temporality because when we first got here, we knew that ev none of these people had the disease. So the fact that we followed them forward and they got the disease under our observation, we know that the disease came second. And that is a very powerful uh, piece of evidence that the exposure is what caused the disease. We, we, we still don't know. Um, the same way, like that classic like thought experiment, well, well it's classic to epidemiologists and, and stuff, but just, um, if the rooster crows every morning and then the sun comes up, uh, you're going to observe that time and time again. The rooster crows and then the sun comes up. So um, if you follow this logic blindly, basically you could argue that the rooster is causing the sun to come up. Um, but that being said, knowing that exposure comes first is a huge step. So just kind of diving into these temporality issues a bit more. Um, we like I said, we have to try and figure out that the exposure uh, comes before the disease, and also we want to make sure the exposure that we're measuring is etiologically relevant. So that means it is relevant to the disease status of the person right now. So I'm gonna show each of these two things with like a visual example. Um, so reverse causality is that idea that uh, like we we want to show that the exposure happened and then the disease happened. But sometimes the uh, disease came first and then the exposure. And in extreme cases, sometimes ex uh, disease leads to exposure. So it's that's called reverse causality. And like a silly example would be like, if we're just doing a cross-sectional study where we're measuring exposure and outcome status here, let's say this is a disease like, like cancer, where like once someone is diagnosed with cancer, we can assume they're like, I know people can go in remission and stuff, but we can just say they're, they're cancer positive now. Um, so if we're measuring someone's exposure and outcome status today, this would be a person who has the disease and they, at the time of the measure, they're exposed. Uh, this person never got the disease, so they're unexposed and disease negative, and you get the point. Uh, but a silly example would be like if exposure is chemo and the disease is 
cancer, um, basically like exposure to chemo is always going to come second to cancer. And in that sense, cancer is kind of causing exposure to chemo. Um, but if we do a cross-sectional study here and we, let's just say we're an a like an alien that has no concept of chemo and we're just like abducting people and trying to figure out like uh, people who have cancer, why do they, why do they, why do they all also have this like chemo exposure? Maybe chemo is causing cancer because like to the alien that would make a lot of sense because chemo is radiation exposure and radiation causes cancer. So they might be thinking that it's chemo that's causing the cancer when really cancer caused the chemo. Um, another uh, idea is etiological irrelevance. So now we're, we changed the example. So uh, green here is you're a smoker and blue here is you're a non-smoker. Let's say this is lung cancer, these dots. And this is our sampling day. So this person is a non-smoker who has cancer and this person is a smoker has cancer um, but this is an example where exposure status can change uh, so um, basically someone went from being a smoker to a non-smoker this person quit smoking and this person took up smoking um, so there's a this is a particularly weird example because uh, let's just say this person spent this would have been better to have is like decades because obviously lung cancer doesn't happen in this time frame but Let's say it was like decades and this person logged a lot of time as a smoker and then quit smoking and then got lung cancer and, and this is where they were measured as someone who is a non-smoker who has lung cancer. That might not be relevant because although they're currently a non-smoker, they logged a lot of time as a smoker. So they're they're basically count being counted in this study as a non-smoker who got cancer and they are contributing to evidence that um, basically smoking doesn't cause cancer because as far as the studies as far as this cross-sectional study is concerned they're someone who has always been a non-smoker and they um, basically got lung cancer um, another another problem here is this person logged a ton of time as a non-smoker and then they've they've logged a very small amount of time as a smoker and got the disease so the, 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 the study is considering them a smoker who has the disease, but there's no way that, that smoking has caused it because they have only logged like a few months as a smoker. This, this lung cancer probably came from like occupational exposure or just bad luck. Um, or that's what, I, that's what I mean by like with prevalence, it's hard to, like someone's exposure status today might not be representative of why they have the disease or why they don't have the disease. Um, so that's why if you capture people's exposure over time, it's a lot easier to make sure that their exposure status that is being measured is etiologically relevant. Uh, this is another example. I, I have another video that is like incidence and prevalence and disease duration that covers this in more detail. But just briefly, let's say these X's are when someone's diagnosed and the red dots are when they die. You can see that like this person here had a long disease duration. They, they logged a lot of years between their diagnosis and death. Well, this person had a short disease duration. Their, their, their time as a case was very small. They were diagnosed and died almost right away. Let's say we were measuring uh, prevalence right now at this dotted line. You can see that the, that the people, like this time between diagnosis and death is your time as a case in the population. And when you're a case in the population, that's the only time you can contribute to prevalence because once you are either cured or die, you're no longer a member of the population. So these people are not part of this prevalence measure. And neither are these people because they didn't have the disease yet. They're considered disease negative as far as this prevalence is con concerned. Um, but you can see that uh, this example is a little contrived, but you can on a large scale, this is what's more likely to happen. Uh, where these people with a really long disease duration are over pretty much the only ones who were captured by this prevalence measure. And this has some problems because because these cases of long duration are the ones who are being measured, uh, two potential problems happen. Uh, the fact that these people are living longer might mean they're a healthier subset of, uh, of the population. So there might be reasons they're living longer. Um, they might be healthier in the sense that they have a better diet or exercise more or just take care of themselves better. 
And another more insidious thing is it could be the whatever exposure we're interested in. Like, let's just say, um, again, like we're measuring chemo and uh, chemo and cancer. Let's just say people who, are, who undergo chemo have a longer disease duration because they're living longer with the disease. Um, we might falsely attribute uh, chemo to causing the disease when really it's the reason we're finding chemo present in so many of these prevalent cancer patients is because chemo is causing them to live longer and hence more likely to be in the population at any slice of time. And uh, we might falsely think that, that chemo is the problem when really it's helping. Yeah. Uh, so these issues I've just described, like reverse causality and etiological irrelevance, they're not a problem when your objective is descriptive. The whole, my whole video here has kind of been talking about analytic objectives where you're trying to like figure out whether an exposure is causing a disease but if you're just trying to like go to that village and ask how many people have polio and how many people are exposed to well water and you have no interest in in whether one's causing the other then these issues of temporality are no longer a problem really just because you're you're not interested in whether the exposure came first because you don't care if the exposure is causing the disease. You just want to know how much exposure there is and how much disease there is. So just quickly, again, this comes up in much more detail in my uh, prevalence and incidence video, but uh, basically prevalence is a function of incidence and duration where um, it's a function of the amount of uh, disease entering the population, basically, like the amount of disease that is newly occurring over time and the duration, so the amount of time people spend diseased, where if they die right away, then prevalence is gonna be lower at any given time because uh, although new cases are being added all the time, they're not lasting very long. Um, and like we learned today, prevalence ratio is the prevalence in the exposed over prevalence in the unexposed. And since we learned from this equation that uh, prevalence is incidence times duration, we know that we can do incidence times duration in exposed and incidence times duration in unexposed because that's what prevalence is according to this formula. But if we can make an assumption that those who are exposed and those who are unexposed um, have the same disease duration, so whether you're exposed or not, like you are, your time spent diseased, you don't die any quicker basically or get cured any quicker, um, then we can basically assume that this, this uh, equals one and then we have this thing where, where uh, prevalence ratio can be taken to, to be an incidence ratio. And an incidence ratio is much more valuable because of the reasons I've talked about. Um, and yeah, there's two things that threaten this equality though that, that make this not true. Uh, the first one is that if exposure is related to disease, um, so uh, for example, if you're exposed, um, you're more like your time as a, as a as disease positive is is lower or uh, yeah basically I, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head but I guess just basically the idea is like in those who are exposed and diseased they die really quickly while those who are unexposed and diseased their time with cancer say is is several more years once that is happening then prevalence ratio doesn't equal incidence ratio also, if the disease is very common, then this equality uh, no longer is true. So basically, prevalence ratio can estimate incidence ratio when the disease is rare and when the duration of the disease is unrelated to exposure.